A guy called Hardy and a guy called Weinberg worked together and came up with the idea that we could use calculus to solve genetics problems. They worked out that in any population, you've got a dominant gene and a recessive gene. And they said, well, hold on. Why don't we say the frequency of A in the population equals P? And the frequency of small a in the population is Q. If we do that, what happens if we then do a Punnett square using P and Q? Now, because we know there are only big A and small a in our population, we can start off with our first piece, P plus Q must equal 1. The frequency of the dominant allele and the frequency of the recessive allele added together adds up to the whole lot. Common sense. As long as we're using a diploid system, normal dominant recessive, this works nicely. So they could then add that the frequency of alleles in the population equals frequency of the first allele times frequency of the second. Of course, we're talking about a system here that is diploid. So you've got two copies of each allele. For example, you could be large A, small A. The first allele, the frequency of that will be P plus Q times the second allele, P plus Q. The frequencies of these, your first allele, will match up with the frequencies there. So the frequency overall is P plus Q all squared. Now for those people that have done a bit of maths before, you can expand this out. Equals P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Have we seen that before in maths by any chance? Yeah. And now this is common old everyday application of that aspect of maths. They're saying the frequency of alleles in a population matches that. If I look at somebody, for example, a tongue roller, do we know if they are large A, large A, or large A, small A? No. We don't know. Are they P squared, because P refers to big A, big A? Or are they PQ, big A, small A? We don't know. That doesn't help us. The key to using this to get an answer is this thing. What does Q squared refer to? Small r, small r, homozygous recessive. Are they easily identified in a population? Absolutely, they're the only one that is easily identified in a population. So we can now use this to work out the frequency of alleles in a living and real population. Let's invent a population then. The key to solving this problem is Q squared, working out the proportion of individuals that are homozygous recessive. So to do that, our non-rollers, which is Q squared, because they are small r, small r, are 8 out of the total, which is 192 plus 8, which is 8 equals 0 0.04. Therefore, Q squared is 0 0.04. Q equals the square root of 0 0.04, 0 0.2. Now, our question says, what is the frequency of big R and little r? We've just worked out the frequency of small r, which was q, the frequency of our smaller letter. If we know the frequency of our smaller or recessive allele, we can work out the frequency of the dominant allele quickly, because p plus q equals 1. So if q is 0.2, p must be 0 0.8. Look at the question and answer it. What is the frequency of big R and little r? So the frequency of big R, 0 0.8. Frequency of smaller 0.2. That's a fairly basic problem. We could actually extend it a little bit like this. So how many people in this population are heterozygous? If we go back up here, P squared, frequency of homozygous dominant. Q squared, frequency of homozygous recessive. 2PQ, frequency of heterozygous. Since we already know P and Q, we can simply plug them in. The frequency of heterozygous equals 2PQ equals 2 times 0 0.8 times 0 0.2 equals 0 0.32. Have we answered our question here? No, we haven't answered the question yet. The question says how many people. We've only worked out a frequency. So our last job is to apply this frequency to a total population of 200. So to answer the question, the number of people equals the population times the proportion equals 200 students times 0 0.32 equals 64 students or 64 people. Now this is how we apply the Hardy-Weinberg law. Soon we'll look at why it doesn't really work. When the Hardy-Weinberg law was first published, they thought it was fantastic. They thought it was great. 
My God, we can actually calculate the frequency of alleles. I'm sure they did have uses to do that. But very quickly, people suddenly realised that it's a great, great idea, but it doesn't quite work. The easiest way to see that would be to do the following. Let's work out a next generation. We've got two individuals. The alleles each individual has, one allele is going to have the frequency of big A, whatever they have, frequency of small A. Second individual, same again. So if these two individuals were to breed, P plus Q times P plus Q, we get P plus Q all squared, which gives us P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Now this is exactly the same as the parental generation. This implies that each generation must be identical to the previous one. So people suddenly realise it only works for a static population and not for a real population. All populations have immigration and emigration. Unless it's the number of organisms locked in a bottle that can't get out, then it's not going to work. There are a few assumptions we have to make in order for Hardy-Weinberg to work, such as you've only got two alleles. Only dominant and recessive. You must have a large population. There must be random mating. There must be no immigration or immigration. And finally, there must be no directional selection. When you look at this, it very quickly becomes aware that this is not a real world situation. There are no populations that have random mating, no directional selection, and no immigration and immigration. There are populations that have some of these. For example, oysters releasing their gametes into the water, totally random mating. But because those are in the water, they're then moving around. Immigration and emigration is very strong there. No directional selection really means no selection pressures. There are no populations that fit this. So it works for what they call an ideal population, but not for a real population.